so I decided to try and do the reading and savor readouts book so that I can see the words. <laughs> I can listen to a lot of reading out loud if I can't see. So uh, that being said, we are on to chapter five, things that go bump in the night. When ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties, the things that go and the things that go bump in the night, dear Lord, deliver us. It's an old Celtic prayer. These songs from a few centuries ago surely were inspired by the species of spook very noticeable in any collection of ghost stories. Those that focus on frightening or puzzling sounds. These range from horrendous blasts that seem to fracture the air to pleasant murmurs or fragments of music or strident human conversation in places where the listener knows such sounds are impossible. This category, too, should perhaps include sensations that bump human consciousness silently, including included excuse me, ooh, included could be odors or overpowering sensations of the nearness of evil, and in this class could be the feeling of a light touch from a hand or a pet's paw or a rough pushing or jostling. Missourians have reported some of each. Case in point, her voices. Wildwood was one, near Centralia. One day, one of the owners, Terry Frazier, was working in the barn with an associate, Donna Sapp, whose retired show champion, Sir Lovelot, lived at Wildwood. The two people were half the barn's length apart when both heard someone yell out, Terry, you're being paged, Donna commented, and Terry stepped into the barn door from where he expected to see his wife, Lynn, on the porch of her home. But he saw nobody. There was no car in the driveway, which is visible straight to the country road, and nobody was in sight anywhere. He walked to the house where he found Lynn, deep in a fire pit, surprised to see him. Nobody could have driven up to the barn and shouted and driven away again. Frazé and Sap knew nobody would regard a practical joke as worthy of taking a long walk from the road and hiding behind the barn while Terry went to the house. It had not been a child's voice, it was female, with no particular urgency. Both had assumed Lynn needed Terry's help in some way, or wanted to remind him of something. The incident defied logical explanation. Just checking it. A similar event occurred with my mother-in-law. My husband and I were starting on a motor trip to be gone several days, so we stopped at her house first to make sure there was nothing she needed before we left. She assured us everything was fine for her, and she made it. And she made her usual affectionate farewell, commending us, as always, to heavenly protection. That night, when my husband made his usual all's well phone call to her, we heard a distraught account of his mother's panic through the day. Less than an hour after you left, she told him, I heard you call me from the sunroom. You said nothing but Ma, the way you do to let me know you're in the house. Just that one word. But I would swear anyway that it was your voice. When I found nobody was there, I was sure something had happened. I called the hospitals and highway patrol. This lady belonged to a generation that firmly believed coming events cast their shadows before them, and that anything can be predicted if one only reads the signs right. She had no doubt that hearing her son's voice was a warning of tragedy, but because she also knew how some of her descendants regarded such belief, she added, I didn't imagine this. I wasn't dozing in my chair or even thinking about you. I was on my feet in the bathroom, getting ready for my hairdresser appointment. Yet I never heard anything more clearly or naturally in my life, and in my life than your voice was then. Owl as prophet. One young woman told solemnly of a neighborhood event that affected several families. They have nice homes in Columbia cul-de-sac, centered in a charming little green slash woods, and a, and all were devastated one winter night when a young woman, stranger to all, took her own life there. Their sympathy for her was tempted was tempered by regret that the place which had always given them peace would be permanently tainted now with the memory of tragedy. But there was one very strange thing about this, the storyteller said. For five nights before the death, a screech owl called out in our little woods. Many of us had lived our whole lives without ever hearing this call, really eerie, sounding like a lost soul. Most of us thought owls just went, who? Who? Anyone who heard this in our park alerted others so we could come out and listen and let our children have the experience. Some of us have lived here for many years and have never before known of an owl being in our woods. We are in the center of town, after all, situated between two big and but busy streets. The punchline to this is that the owl was heard no more after the suicide. 
in the neighborhoods of Cherokee descent told them that, to many native tribes, the owl was considered a harbinger of death. Though they respect its beauty, power, and stealth, few native people incorporate its name into their own. A Kansas City newspaper called The New Times had a story in November 1993 about a house identified only as Bob's house because the family did not want their lives complicated by publicity. Bob said he felt he had brought their problems on, on them himself, having found that when the attic door was slightly ajar, opening a certain other door on the second floor would cause the attic door to rattle. He used that as a ploy to get his children to bed at night, telling them the ghosts were not ready to come the ghosts were ready to come out. Not long after Bob started doing this, the family began to experience some poltergeist like activity. For instance, a bowl of fruit flew off a counter before the eyes of several people and smashed to the floor. More common though were worrisome sounds, scratchings came from inside the walls. And though the family tried to attribute these to mice or squirrels, the noise suggested something much bigger and went quickly from place to place all over the house. And how could the sound of water running in the walls be explained when the plumber could find no cause for it and nobody found water damage anywhere? Bob's family also heard heavy steps going up and down the attic stairs, sometimes pausing so that weary sighs were audible. Fortunately, manifestations never got worse than this. Everyone adapted. They were still in the house when the story was published, and Bob was quoted as saying, We decided if it does turn out to be something, it's nothing, if you know what I mean. The Choking Ghost One reader told of events in a farmhouse on the Osage River. I think my grandparents moved there in, 19, in 1897, he said. My mother was born there in 1900. It was a very nice place for the time. Several rooms with two big porches. It belonged to a doctor who had moved to town and used his farm as rental property. The farm's large, nice-laying acreage was what attracted the storyteller's gr German grandfather, and his being a hard-headed Dutchman made him dismiss what the neighbors said. They warned that the place was haunted by the ghost of the doctor's daughter, Lucy, who had died there at 14 of tuberculosis. It was rumored, they said, that the girl's stepmother was callous to her sufferings and did very little to ease them. The haunting reportedly began when the neighbors were sitting up for the girl's body, as was customary then. They said that suddenly all over the house came small crashes, as if every window one by one slammed down. Only a few days later, they said, the doctor and his second wife moved out of the house, but they denied any unusual reason for doing so so abruptly. The first sounds the German family heard were in the walls, scrambling and scratching, which, as in Bob's house, moved about rapidly from place to place. At the same time, the sound seemed too loud for mice or squirrels, especially when they went overhead. There they sounded like some very large animal pouncing and play and rolling about. From the ground, nobody could see openings big enough for any animal. Access to the attic from inside was not possible because, in wallpapering the house, the couple had covered the attic trap door, which they never expected to need. Tearing that paper off, it spoiled the looks of the room, so they never saw into the attic until some roof repairs were made. Then they could climb up on ladders and peer in. Even the father admitted there was no evidence of animal occupancy. occupancy. Decades of dust on the floor lay undisturbed. Before that, however, family members heard increasing alarming sounds, coughing, choking, and gasping. As the practical mining father kept pointing out, sounds can't hurt anyone, the family adapted, even to the point of joking about them. If the distressed sounds occurred while guests were present, the mother poked the ceiling with a broomstick and ordered Lucy to be still. She usually obeyed. The local minister was the one person who heard Lucy's agonized efforts to breathe, and he was much upset, advising the family to move at once. As if in reassurance, organ music began. It was always heard when nobody was near the organ, perhaps on the porch or tending flower beds or otherwise occupied outdoors. Even when they all they locked all doors, but the one they used as an exit and could see from where they were, the music continued. Only a few times did anyone see anything in the house. Once, when a child was sick and the mother was sleeping with it, she sat. She said that she awakened to see a white figure seated on the edge of the bed, putting her hand, putting out her hand. She implored, "What have I done?" Why won't you stop pestering us? 
The figure slowly rose to the ceiling and disappeared. A maiden aunt, who was a member of this family, said that she too had seen a white figure, as did one of the grandmothers to whom while she recovered from malaria. The father pointed out, as today's ghost experts do, that anything seen when one is sick and fever should be discounted. The same goes, we're told, for whatever seems to occur during our mind's tricky state between sleeping and awake. The German family left the haunted house in 1906, with the father still maintaining that what the others claimed to have seen and heard was all nonsense. However, his wife said he was not nearly as firm as he had been, as he had been, and she believed he had experienced something he would not admit. Granny's perfume. Sometimes a very bad odor or a pleasant one is the feature of a haunting, as Missouri Ghost recounted in the case of Lilac Hill, near Fayette, and in Skyrim Farm, near Columbia. A smell that mixed attractive and repelling qualities often seemed to foreshadow what misfortune among some misfortune among the horses, what she called the sweet burning, alerted owner Alice Thompson and her partner Dick Cook to take particular care. A detailed account of a spiritual contact by odor came from Ken Lowry in the appendix. A few years ago, he lost a grandmother who had been very dear to him. Though not much experience with bereavement, he instinctively did some grief therapist did some grief th- something grief therapist advocates. He wrote about his feelings. He composed a poem to his mother for a Mother's Day gift. The poem described his grief for his grandmother and the renewed gratitude it gave him for the mother he still had. Sitting on the floor of his home, Tim read this poem aloud, hardly able to read for crying, but he managed to struggle through. His reward, he says, was a sudden strong wafting of his grandmother's perfume, sort of rosy, was his description, with a cl- with clean country things added, and there was something in the air, whiteness and sparkly stuff. He felt that the aroma came through his north wall and left the same way, but it remained for several minutes and gradually faded away and seemed to be followed out by an impulse of gently moving air. While the scent lasted, Tim found himself asking his grandmother wordlessly but with great intensity if she was all right, and he felt her replying that she was fine. And so was his grandfather, and so was Tim's dog, Ozzy, who had died about 18 months earlier. She also seemed to convey to Tim that she and her husband were very proud of him. Tim emphasizes that he said nothing aloud except the poem, and that his grandmother's reply came directly into his mind. I cried and cried, he said, even though feelings of peace and love came from the experience. This was exactly the feeling he had always had when going to his grandmother's for help with problems, or with a triumph or pleasure to share. The incident, Tim says, changed his feelings about death for all time. One last call. Paul Pepper of Columbia lost his mother a few years ago, and he tells of something unforgettable that happened as he moved the last of her belongings into his own home for sorting and dispersal to various friends and relatives. He was staring down at the basement steps of a box that contained, among other things, his mother's telephone. This had special meaning for him, because her home had been in another town, and phone calls had been a precious link between them. As he descended to his basement, the telephone uncharged for six months rang clearly and loudly. This was not the kind of jangling you might expect from its being dropped or jolted around, Pepper says. It had been moved around all day, carried downstairs in St. Louis, put in the car, taken out of the car, carried over the driveway and the lawn. If it was just moving it, why didn't any of that activity make it ring? Did Paul answer the ring? Yes, he said. Instinctively, I did. There was, of course, no response, but the telephone figured in a comforting dream in which his mother called to tell him she was still nearby and would help him through his bereavement. All, as for us, what about your own experiences, readers often ask, assuming that whomever researches the supernatural must have been inspired by ghostly encounters of her own. I can recall little that even remotely qualifies unless a legitimate niche exists for olfactory hallucinations. During college days, I once smelled gas so strongly in the night that I woke others up. They could smell nothing, and the house did not explode. Then or later, once, when I was in the woods alone, at least a mile from any house, I enjoyed several minutes of aroma of brownies baking too much, and this day drew their delectable crusty edges. Only the sex was to make me go home and bake brownies. Another experience I've never stopped wondering about was the recurrent smell of baking brownie. The first time, the odor was so persuasive and lasted that I went to the kitchen to see if some burglar was having a snack before leaving. The bacon smell came several more times, 
always when I was awakened by my neighbor returning home at four o'clock or so from coon hunting. It infuriated me that I had to listen to the welcoming chorus of hounds. I hadn't been allowed to go. A lot of banging at of his tailgate as he unloaded his gear and dogs. Then gushing water and rattling feed cans as he took care of the animals' needs before going inside. I knew that my neighbor would have a big breakfast, then lie down for a couple hours sleep before going to work. But both our houses were shut up, and his kitchen was in the middle of his house, on the side away from ours. There's no way I could smell what he was cooking. Once after a visit with a friend, I found my car thick with the smell of my father. He had been gone for years. My friend and I had not been talking about him, and I had no particularly strong thoughts about him that day. He had never been in my car, and I had been in no car with him since my childhood. Yet there it was, whiskey, bull Durham tobacco, sun-dried cham- chambray shirt, and other indefiable elements of a personal odor. I have always loved. It had been associated for me with distribution of money in comic books, solutions for problems, and interest in conversation. I sat and inhaled my father's scent for as long as it lasted, thankful for what seemed like a little visit. My psychic friend would tell me that was exactly what it was, but if my father initiated it, why then? Why not soon after his death, when it would have been so comforting to be able to think he was still alive? Adele Graham, illustrator of this book, and others, says she has had several thought-provoking little experiences, never of any later significance, seldom dramatic. This is typical. I had a cat named Mal, who lived an exceptionally long life with my family. He was very beautiful, and we all considered him highly intelligent. Often, after his death, I felt Mal joining me on the couch when I'd nap there. On the bed at night, I sometimes still feel his weight as usual, pulling covers tight over my feet. One of his habits was that he regularly sought out my car keys to take. He often reminded me in this way that I'd left them in an unusual place and saved me the trouble of a frantic search the next morning. Only a few weeks ago, I had left my keys lying on the couch. I knew I knew they were, I knew they were here, but some hours into the evening, here came the familiar jingle. How can I explain this, since the keys had been laying there for hours and nobody was up walking around to jar the floor of the couch? Not long ago, Abel says, her mother, Shannon, having just washed her hair, reached out blindly for a towel which she'd left conveniently on the counter. Instead, it fell to her fingers and met the familiar curves of Mal's head. When Shannon looked, there was nothing on the counter but the towel. It would be easy to dismiss all such stories as evidence of human power to create private sensations for emotional comfort. But that doesn't explain incidents that seem unrelated to happenings past or subsequent. Surely, if visual hallucinations are possible, that olfactory or oral or tactical hallucinations must be possible too. Everything seems to go back to one conclusion. A great deal remains for human beings to figure out. That's the end of chapter 5.